Hey there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 545. It should be 545. Welcome back to Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you. Hopefully it's finding you in good health and you are, you know, doing as well as you can during these really strenuous times that we're living in at the moment. I hope you are doing well wherever you may be. If you're listening to this podcast via the audio platforms and via the various streaming apps that exist out there, specifically Apple and also Spotify, please leave me a rating. There is a rating system on Spotify. I don't know how you access. I think no, you access the rating system on Spotify via the mobile app. I'm pretty sure that's where I checked it out. So if you've got access to the Spotify mobile app that you're using on your Android or your iphone device or whatever else then please leave me a rating that'll be greatly appreciated if you're using it on the apple podcast of course leave me a rating there i don't care if it's a one star i don't really care just put some rating as people know that's people listen to the show it's a vanity thing it's obviously an image thing but help man out anyway regardless and it help man out regardless and um yeah that's about it really um obviously bonus episode two of the show is available on patreon you know the links in the description no more things i've already dropped a review of the um nothing lasts forever um documentary about dash no so if you're interested in that definitely check out the patreon the link is in the description and just you know support of any kind is always appreciated great to see some of my followers joining on people sending nice messages i appreciate that so thank you thank you thank you you're going to be listening to this hopefully sometime on saturday i'm going to just drop it i'm going to mix things up a bit now and just drop the episodes in four and then do the clips later on because people seem to enjoy that a bit more i think somebody asked that in the comments so i'm just going to listen to that but if you listen to the audio version you won't really care because i just keep dropping that in four in here regardless so you'll be okay with that and apart from that we're just going to keep trucking on and we're just going to keep trucking on what else has been going on with i nothing else still doing the hard 75 that's been a pretty interesting challenge to get a grip to grips with the running all the time has been a bit hard the weightlifting has been hard especially today for whatever reason i decided to wake up you know extremely fasted went to the gym without hydrating myself and i felt quite dizzy for the hour or so i was in there so that's probably a mistake or an approach i will not repeat going forward but apart from that pretty decent like i mentioned in the previous pod it's just funny to see the entire gym thin out completely hardly anyone's in there nowadays which you know is both funny and um and somewhat disappointing but i also think people have far better things to worry about than working out really people have real life things going on that they need to maybe um have the entire attention um paid to and maybe people have just decided that there are other things that make that are more of a priority in their life than flipping pumping are you know running nowhere on the flipping treadmill and i get it i bloody get it but yeah i'm still doing it i'm still pumping i've still got the calluses on my hands and whatnot you know i'm still lifting the weights and doing a thing and trying to work as hard as i can and so far it's going pretty pretty well but anyway let's enough of that let's jump straight into it loads of things to talk about loads of things to get into so i don't want to waste any more time let's just dive on deep first things first there's this weird article that popped up out of nowhere from the independent regarding supposedly the court of sorry the cult of joe rogan which i don't really understand so the headline says as follows why has the uk fallen for the cult of joe rogan for whatever reason the last few months it seems like joe has become the um de facto enemy of the media they've kind of made it their mission to paint him out as bad as they can just because he doesn't you know adhere to the current narrative that says all vaccines are good all boosters are good which is bizarre because you know the guy is extremely extremely wealthy he just signed a flipping what hundred dollar hundred million dollar deal with spotify which is supposedly from the noises that you hear out of people that work within a comedy scene of podcasts and stuff people are saying that it's way up in the 300s but of course because there's so much money he's not going to come and correct you if you say it's less but supposedly it's in the 300 million sort of mark which is insane and it's only a licensing agreement too it's not like they bought the rights to it they don't have any ip they just have it on their platform for a set number of years i think it's six or five i don't know which one it is but regardless, he's a really wealthy guy. And if he decides to have an alternative approach to COVID or an alternative perspective, he's aff- afforded that because he's rich. He doesn't live in our world. He doesn't live in our reality. And if anything, it should be, again, the people, humans are weird. In reality, the people who are following him and taking ivermectin and doing all these alternative approaches to dealing with COVID or preventing, preventing themselves from getting it or just flowers saying, I don't care if I get it, whatever it may be 
they should be a little bit they should be a little bit more crude up in the idea that it's hard to kind of follow what some rich guy does because he's a rich guy. It's not exactly, it's not like you're going to be able to do everything he does. Yeah, I know ivermectin is fairly cheap, but all the other protocols that he kind of puts himself through or the things that he's able to do on a daily, weekly basis, you're not going to be able to keep it up. So it's not really worth even comparing, but he's allowed, again, free speech. He's allowed to say what he wants. He's allowed to offer his opinion. He's allowed to have an alternative stance, but for whatever reason, that alternative stance is it essentially X'd him off um, from the good books or the good graces of the me of the mainstream media, and they're doing everything in their power to paint him out to be as worse as a person as possible. And it's unfortunate because I think ultimately the podcast has suffered greatly because of COVID. I hardly listen to the ones involving doctors and comedians and stuff because it's always going to devolve to to flipping COVID talk um I've always said in the podcast already before that even I'm a big fan of Joe Rogan definitely COVID has broken his brain he doesn't have an ability to be objective he can't admit when he's wrong which are all traits of Rogan that we all loved the fact that he was able to admit his mistakes hold his hands up say he doesn't know um defer to the experts now he's suddenly turned into an expert because he's got a folder full of links of articles that he reads online you know horror porn like COVID horror porn or something that he kind of gets involved in and He's even spawned an entire genre of detractor content now of people basically debunking stuff that he says. So it's probably a good thing. He's feeding a lot of people. People are now reacting to the misinformation, quote unquote, he puts out. They're basically correcting the narrative. Then you've got that podcast called Decoding the Gurus that went in on him pretty much. You know, or that's been going on in him since he's been ranting and raving about pod COVID. So it's probably been a net positive and a net negative for him. And if, and everyone else that surrounds it but this article that skim read before is fairly positive to be honest but it's still weird that people are pay paying this guy so much attention considering the issues that we have especially in the states in the uk maybe it's a bit different because we've basically decided to live with covid but if you live in the states you have far better things to be worrying about right no free health care student debt um places still have, don't have clean water you know, police departments entirely, well, not police departments, like trigger happy police departments, non accountable police departments, um, misallocations of funds, of public funds, like really crazy stuff like the education system, all loads of things that need to be corrected and worked with corrupt officials or officials that have conflicts of interest, things that really need to be addressed. But instead, everyone's focusing on a flipping podcast. So it's like, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? So this is the article courtesy of Independent. It says there's something idiosyncratic. track of my words, my ability to read is so bad right now. There's something so sorry, there's something idiosyncratically American about Joe Rogan. There you go, I got it out. Maybe it's his frat boyish persona, his passions for hunting and extreme sports. Perhaps but most of all, Joe Rogan can body some whimsical notion on the American dream. A college dropout turned stand up comedian who worked his way up to become one of the world's media titans. His podcast Joe Rogan experience I was licensed to Spotify in 2020 in a deal reportedly worth 100 million I've heard this more last year it was Spotify's most streamed podcast of course in the US and the UK Rogan as anyone would have to admit is quite the big deal that was actually a master trick if you think about it if you want to launch a streaming platform especially for podcasting the best way to launch it is just to grab the one that's got the biggest audience the one that's maybe the most controversial um and basically let him run free that's the easiest way to kind of garner attention right and then he jumps on and he starts inviting alex jones tim dylan all these you know i mean he, he invites those free flipping um covid doctor guys to come in like just absolutely turns it up a notch celebrities known people not known people like that's the easiest way to do it they absolutely crushed it and for whatever reason apple didn't apple should have had him locked down from ages ago but you know they were asleep at the wheel he continues to say, and yet he's polarizing figure, a staunch libertarian. Rogan has faced accusations of sexism, transphobia, of the remarks made in the podcast. His diverse list of guests include everyone from aliases to online eccentrics, Robert Downey Jr., Kanye West, Edward Snowden, Elon Musk, among those who have graced his show. Rogan has become known for hosting controversial guests in his program, allowing the airing of offensive opinions and misinformation, something that's become increasingly scrutinized during the pandemic. Last week, a group of 270 medical experts, which they're not medical experts, <laughs> Politicians Spotify to curb COVID related misinformation. They claim is being shared on Rogan's podcast, branding Rogan a menace to public health. Bruv, what about Fauci? Isn't Fauci a menace to public health? This attention seeking ghoul. Like, isn't he a menace to public health? Like, what is this? 
the CDC, aren't they menaces to public health? Nah, okay, cool. Um, the streaming giant has yet to respond. It's right to condemn Rogan's handling um of covid of course he was invited he has invited numerous vaccine skeptics onto his experience of the past few years when rogan himself contracted covid last year he became a proponent for controversial and medically dubious drug evermectin often used for deworming livestock why do they always say the deworming livestock thing as if to like take away any of the benefits of ivermectin clearly it does work for some people in the same way that clearly some people when they get the vaccine they develop some crazy crazy side effects what what is this i don't understand this is why i think there's a weird conspiracy going on where big pharma don't want you to flip in take this very readily available cheap drug because they want to point you in the direction of whatever the vaccine is like it's just bizarre it's bizarre how everybody seems to be in a looks always be suspicious when everyone keeps repeating the same mantra or the same phrase or the same line the same sentence you always see it keeping getting mentioned regardless of what publication it is this is the independent right supposedly in a uk um, publication a uk news source that's basically repeating the same lines that you hear from news outlets in the us which is also going to repeat it by the same people in different parts of europe different parts of southeast asia it's very suspicious always be suspicious of that sort of stuff it really makes you think there's some sort of coordinated um you know takedown attack being you know being pulled off or being the strings are being pulled by someone higher up because that is really weird the fda clearly states while there are uh, approved uses for ivermectin in people and animals it is not approved for the prevention of treatment of covid19 yeah okay let's listen to the fda his critics brand him an idiot if so he's an idiot with a platform um of a statesman that's the thing i don't get too if he's an idiot i think this is something that you always kind of have to learn later on in life if he is an idiot why don't they just copy what the idiot does and crush him <clears throat> if you think he's spreading misinformation copy what the idiot does and be more successful and then offer the alternative perspective or the alternative view that you think is correct instead they don't instead they bitch and moan and whine and basically what they're basically saying is that hey get take away his right to talk because he's not talking he's not saying the stuff that we like but it's like no if you don't like what he's saying offer an alternative take make it compelling enough and then let the people decide this is why i have a problem with counterculture it's the same thing counterculture works the same way counterculture is no you don't get a right to speak at all we we're basically the judge and the jury and we basically deem that you don't have a right to earn a living you don't have a right to speak no i have a right to speak whether everyone listens to me is another thing if i'm accused of something heinous and all the sponsors walk away and my fans turn their back on me then i have to bear those consequences fine no problem but what they do what they do in the industry or the world even in general mainstream media is that they point they paint you out to be a terrible person with no re with, with no redeeming qualities and no redemption arc so that essentially you might as well just stand there and die that's what they want you to do they want you just to disappear if there's a hole they could open up and push you into they would it's just heinous man it really is and it, like for whatever reason honestly i was one of the naive ones that thought when covid started or when COVID was spreading and we we're all in lockdown around the world and then the whole George Floyd thing happened, I was really under naive uh, idea that somehow that was going to bring us together as people, that somehow we were going to recognize that all our governments are somewhat fucked up and they're like basically not here to serve the people and only here to serve their own self-interest. Um, it's rules for me and not for D, what sort of, that sort of stuff, right? And you thought that was what it was going to be, that we were going to collectively band together as quote-unquote global citizens and there was going to be some sort of uprising, some sort of we've had enough, put our feet down and the change is coming. Instead, that hasn't happened. Instead, they've quashed every single uprising that's so far taken place. Any kind of... Um, this the only thing that sort of basically stood around right if i think about it from the gamestop stuff that they changed the rules in you know robin hood flipping changed the app stop people being able to buy shares like they've done everything to crush us as people the only thing that's really stood the test of time it feels like for this entire occasion has been maybe working from home and also the anti-work movement people have kind of put their foot down and said nah no more even to the case where i've heard a story of you know the uk might be trialing a four-day work week in one company i forgot which one it was so clearly that was been the only thing we've won at but in terms of holding the governments and the you know our you know versions of cdc accountable for the way that they've dealt with covid that's not happened at all zero even boy, look at boris boris is still hanging on for dear life even though he clearly broke the rules that he set out for everyone else compromised himself essentially devalued everything he says lied to the british public and then now he's holding on to his job for what reason like 
Um, blah, blah, blah. In the UK, though, his success is more puzzling. What is it that sets him apart from the most uh, reactionary US media that fails to make a hay on outside the Atlantic? Fox News is wildly sneered at, held up as some kind of shabby, transparent bias operation. Our own dem bigoted, um, sorry, our own bigoted, deceitful right wing media is scarcely less malignant in mind. Sorry, it's, 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 it's scarcely less malignant mind. Um, incidentary white ring personalities such as uh, Alex Jones or the late Rush Limbaugh have no real sway here. We have our own reactionary four horns, fog horns. You might as well buy British. And yet, while Rogan still remains a fringe figure when it comes to traditional media, the Spotify charts don't lie. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested about that. I think, to be fair though, the left media that we have here, stuff like The Guardian, it's probably not worth listening to in it in general when it comes to uh, politics and social issues um it's a very skewed um perspective on what what life is like in the uk and obviously on the other side of things when it comes to gb news that's probably way too skewed on that side of things so there's no real there's no real good alternative labor is a shell of a, the party it used to be it doesn't really stand for anything it kind of just goes with the wind um so i can understand why some people are just like okay cool i'm just going to stick with the conservative side of things because at least they i will say they stand for something but at least they have some sort they, they have some selling point in terms of their worldview, in terms of how they view society, how they view the economy, education, you know, stuff like that. Maybe that, that's why people lie on, but I don't really get it overall. I don't really get either side, to be honest. I think they're all as bad as each other. The continuity says, on one hand, um, this attests to an ever more purest boundary between one of our, one, one, two, sorry, our two cultures. American culture already pervades our television, our news websites, and our social media feeds. Why would podcasts be immune? But more than this, Rogan's international popularity reveals something fundamental about the man's appeal. To some extent, Rogan's approach to interviewing is one rooted in open-mindedness. He takes a fairly egalitarian approach to booking guests, usually appears more willing to indulge whatever they have to say. And the problem is that this holds true whether he's welcoming a leftist politician such as Bernie Sanders, whom Rogan endorsed as president during the 2020 Democratic uh, Democracy, sorry, Democratic, Democratic primary, which Bernie Sanders got fucked over in ironically enough no one talks about that anymore but we move um to small amount of contro controversy among the left or a debunked conspiracy theorist most of the opinions that float rogan's way are met with furrow brow crudity uh crudulity. i can't read anything in it my god what's happened to me man i need to start reading my books again um his vocal advocacy of psychedelic drugs um use ties into the his ideology on some level he is simply a man trying to make sense of the world which i don't understand why that's a problem and i also don't understand this idea that you know <clears throat> if if someone comes out and endorses bernie who's as left as they get but then somehow is also welcoming to bring on who's that one-eyed guy um that conservative nut job right why does that in, in, in immediately invalid his platform because he's willing to have those two people on there i don't get it it's so bizarre um it just doesn't make any sense and i don't know why you're so for some people you're not allowed to interview other people it just doesn't matter like i don't get that like this whole platforming thing it's like the f the fans should always decide if they don't want to listen to your thing or they turn away you should then bear the consequences of it i think you're seeing it now with um there's a controversy happening with the podcast caller daddy where the host of that show is interviewing jamie lynn spears right the much hated sister of britney spears who for whatever reason doesn't seem to be that loving of her sister right doesn't seem to care about her conservatorship too much and whatever i don't know what's going on there but they seem to have a little bit of friction there and people don't seem to like her too much because people love britney so obviously if the sister's not um team britney or free britney then of course she's going to get hate this girl from Call Her Daddy wants to interview her. Clearly, she's doing it for the view. She doesn't necessarily care about the story of the family, which is fine because I guess Jamie Lynn Spears is probably doing it also for the views in order to get attention on her book that she's releasing. But I don't see what's wrong with interviewing somebody. Like, I don't, especially someone that, he, he, she's not murdered someone. She's not diddled kids and stuff. Do you know what I mean? It's just something that you don't agree with in terms of how they've been dealing with stuff familiarly as a family, sorry, but it's not our business either. We don't know what's going on. The inner workings of their family. But if the fans decide to turn their back on Call Her Daddy and the Alex girl and say, no, we don't like this anymore. We're not going to listen to your podcast. Then I don't want that girl to complain either. You don't get to cry. Because if you're willing to dance with fire or get controversial guests on that people don't like and your fans decide, okay, this is enough, we're not going to support you anymore, you should be able to take that hit on the chin. But people don't. So on one side, people are complaining about who you interview and the other side, the person that's doing the interview is complaining that not everyone loves it. No one can win all the time. Sometimes compromises have to be had and sometimes everyone loses. 
it continues here just to end bit here the last paragraph it says now this doesn't mean that he is successful in his efforts nor does it diminish the harm of some of rogan's offensive comments about for example trans athletes or the decision to give toxic figures such as miley nebulous and multi-million this in the soapbox that's stupid he was already that's the thing with, with milo 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 was a was one of the greatest like rise and falls that we've ever seen in flipping cultural commentary or youtube or politics and whatever right but still he had millions of views before he appeared on joe rogan experience fair enough he might have gave him a boost but he quickly fumbled the bag and messed up himself anyway regardless so that doesn't need to be talk, talked about the um comment about trans athletes n w w someone's comment about what you do in terms of sports isn't gonna is not i don't think that's violence that doesn't count you know what i mean because someone you know is skeptical about your inclusion in martial arts or your inclusion in athletics that doesn't invalidate who you as a person it's just someone's opinion you can still go out and run you can still go out and compete yes it might bring extra scrutiny to you but this is the life that you chose like if you choose and unfortunately in most of the parts of the world choosing whatever unconventional approach to living your life is always going to bring about some sort of scrutiny but the beauty of living living your truth is that you don't care you just always step out you wake up in the morning with a smile on your face and you step out of your house and you just keep on going you don't let people's impression or idea of you um sway the way that you present yourself to the world so i never really understand this whole thing it's, again don't get me wrong the trans athlete debate is annoying really really is annoying people just get over it either you make a division for trans people only or you include them in the gender that that, that they didn't identify with that's it you just move on i don't see the problem and if it's unfair it's not unfair it'll eventually shake itself out i think in general my opinion because like when you get an elite athlete in one division usually everyone's game rises to that person's level so if you get a trans athlete in a flipping women's women's um field and she's absolutely smashing everybody eventually that'll push everyone else to also up their levels <clears throat> to the point where they actually beat that trans athlete legitimately or the trans athlete just ends up winning whatever it is i think it ends up shaking itself out personally you don't win forever in that regard so i think everyone's being hist um, everyone's being hysterical on both ends on one end if someone says they have a problem with you being trans and doing athletics that isn't violence that's not a punch to the face please relax and on the other side it's not that interesting of a topic to talk about if they want to compete let them compete like it continues it says um there are undoubted there are undoubtedly people who listen to rogan because they're aligned with him politically but even then <clears throat> it's not as simple as him being right wing yes he goes on to turgid rants about cancer culture but this is a man who endorsed bernie sanders for president who is more liberal than joe biden and labor's own Keir starmer exactly on issues like drug discrimination this sorry drug decriminalization and who admitted to voting third party in the last elections to some extent rogan's appeal lies in his single-mindedness in an era where both right and left-wing political forums are so often become echo chambers rogan is an outlier a dangerous one maybe but an outlier and nonetheless dangerous man imagine being dangerous because you have alternative views on pol i just don't understand all this ah, the people are just too i don't know man I, what i'm not even saying sensitive whatever the word is there's something that just annoys me that sort of stuff i don't get it but hey what, what can you do um you can check out the article yourself it's called um like i just mentioned I'll go back to the top here <clears throat> it's called this why has the uk fallen for the cult of joe rogan available the independent check it out if you're that way inclined it's a really really good article i recommend it next on list here i want to quickly touch upon team jackets this is like a little rant just for me personally that i'm not really i don't think anybody else will really identify because it, this is triggering but essentially this is news i saw courtesy of hypebeast and they're um, sharing this news regarding pat celebrates his team members personal experiences for spring summer 22 so they obviously have their own version of a team jacket that they're putting out by Peta, and it's really nice you know I'm not going to deny that it doesn't look great but it did remind me of an era in time where it felt like these and it's still it's for some reason it's returning now for some reason there's been some sort of return to team jackets and this whole idea of people in the know being given special limited edition jackets with certain patches and stuff posting it on their feed making themselves look cool basically wanking themselves off and you know, i just hate it it's absolutely lame seeing grown adults pretend that they're in some sort of fictional gang or team or something is just really really lame like the height of lameness especially because most of these adults have been on the scene for like two decades three decades 
you know, with their hands out, getting seeded product and stuff, and then showing off to children that are 18. It doesn't affect me, or it does affect me because I'm the one ranting, but in general, they're showing off to children, like to literal teenagers, um, these grown adults who could be their fathers. Uh, oh, look, I've got this cool jacket, you don't have it. And I absolutely hate it. I think the genesis of it, obviously, from the old school days of, you know, Stussy having their um, crew jackets that they had from back in the day, like, I think maybe the 80s, 90s, there's really good scans of it. You see, the Stushi International crew there was something to it right that tied it or something substantial whether it was surfing skateboarding music DJing nightlife whatever just a scene it was great to see all these people basically being reflected in the lookbook of Stushi because it made you know Stushi International Cruise Sean Stushi was basically one of the kind of forefathers of streetwear it made sense that time but even nowadays you're still seeing people that are you know in their 60s getting Stussy team jackets and stuff for what reason and then showing off on your feed who are you impressing i don't understand this it's just bizarre um and it reminds you of a time back in the day when i used to work for nike i went to this um store called 1948 in shoreditch which at the time was like one of their sort of um uh what would you call it one of their first sort of like limited edition sort of stores they had an another one too in new york i think called mercer something i forgot the name of it but it was launched in conjunction with the beijing olympics and then from then on it kind of evolved into a a sort of location where you could get tier zero um, nike product you could get nike sportswear apparel and other things going on so it's quite a cool little location and afterwards i think for whatever reason ended up closing but it was a great little spot and when we were there for whatever reason i guess maybe licensing laws we weren't officially employed by nike we were basically contractors and as soon as that was the case and we weren't getting paid through nike we basically had to invoice them it immediately caused the friction between us and and t and basically nike uk for whatever reason and my interpretation of it was that in general those sort of companies i'd imagine nike i'd imagine car adidas all these sort of like established like uh sportswearish sort of like lifestyle brands that everyone swore wants to work for they intrinsically have people in there who are cunts intrinsically because in general i would say those sort of roles could be done by anybody i could do them you could do them with your eyes closed it's not easy it's not like a hard job to get and because of that i think the people that are there they kind of get grandfathered in or they get brought in by a friend they always feel a little bit i guess intimidated or whatever it may be by newer blood by fresher talent by people coming in so they make it as hard as they possibly can for you to get in there so you'd be d d dissuaded and will kind of put off and then decide to do your own thing which means they keep the job forever usually because i'd imagine again I've, I've not seen many people in those places i've hanged around them you know for a couple of times but from what i know there's a there's a really low especially for when it comes to middle mid-level jobs in those kind of places people don't leave they stay there forever like you know I'm, I'm sure there's people there working that have been there since i've known them and they've not left those jobs because it's a pretty cushy place you get sick discounts you get a good salary you get to wear nike every single day Jeremy, I mean it's as jobs go it's pretty decent but it kind of breathes this attitude it feels like where it's it's a little bit we're in the cool club you know what i mean you can't it could be with us you're over there and i felt it and again i was working for a flipping legit nike store and i we felt like outsiders so when we felt like outsiders there was this thing that they had going on i forgot what it was part of again it was a promotional thing where they had these nike destroyer <laughs> jackets right and they had one for each city around the world i think all the market cities the one for london blah 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 right london paris milan i don't know they had ones for each location around all the cool places and they gave them to all the quote-unquote movers and shakers in the city who were doing cool things and for whatever reason obviously you know no one's expected to get featured in the ad but for whatever reason people that actually worked in the store never got them i think maybe some people got them through their own links and then they were also given to people that were kind of prominent in the scene people that were kind of doing stuff cool stuff in the scene like going around at that time you know i had a pretty popular blog at the time i was doing a pretty popular well i was doing a party that was semi-popular at a very popular club so you would imagine i would be someone that would have been given that kind of jacket and like oh hey it's recognition that you're doing some cool stuff but that didn't happen and i think a lot of it had to do of course with my personality don't get me wrong i'm pretty sure i shot myself in the foot a couple of times but it just felt like it was still another kind of i'm cool you're not cool sort of thing which i always hated but in general i have to be honest and say i'm thankful for that experience like getting shafted a lot through that experience and not having the ability to do certain things or not even being brought into work with nike overall when when that contract ended or actually didn't end that way i was working 1948 and the person that brought us in was cool then that person left and then the person that was brought in was all right and then that person left and then the other person that got brought in 
just wanting to get rid of everybody and start again from scratch because they didn't like any of us or didn't like me and somebody else maybe i don't know but i was one of the people that basically got let go when the third sort of like head of whatever nike energy marketing came in and that person basically got rid of all of us and basically started again from fresh with their own people which is understandable it's like football right when a new ceo comes in or a new owner they usually get rid of the manager and basically want to get their own people so they can kind of start their own legacy or make their own make their own legacy understandable so i kind of am okay with the sharpness because i think getting shafted and being kind of dismissed in that fashion basically made me it kind of a how do i say this it kind of made me realize and wake up to the fact that i knew kind of well in i wanted to be i kind of started looking at the james jebbias again this is really aiming high the james jebbias the hiroshi fujiwaras the aaron bondaros the sean sushis the negos uh the tetsu nishiyamas right those are my guys now instead of looking at the mid-level people i was like nah those are my kind of north stars those are people that i kind of want to emulate and kind of follow in their footsteps and it kind of positioned me that way and then i just turned into a consumer so instead of kind of trying to lick these guys asses to get these jackets and stuff i just like you know what i'm gonna make my own or i'm gonna work for these companies or whatever i'm gonna start my own thing da, 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 da. those are that that's kind of what the shafting has done but this entire experience was horrible I hated it, hated it, hated it. And since then, it hasn't got any better, really. And it's ironic, too. Like I said, like the people that are still getting these team jackets are old fogies who are legitimately expired and they're showing off to kids. The same way they were showing off to us back in the day. And, you know, they had like five years experience on us, sometimes 10 years experience, and they're showing off that they got these jackets. Yeah, of course, because you've been around since the fucking 80s and you know everybody. Of course, they're going to give it to you. But it's not as if you, this old guy wearing it is going to make me as a kid want it. It's just a limited edition thing that you want. It's not necessarily the person wearing it. It's just because it's rare and it's expensive. Same sort of thing with these sort of jackets. It's just, I don't know, it just it grinds my gears. It really does because it doesn't feel inclusive. It really is othering, it's separating of people. There's this idea that all these people have in the scene where they're always like, talking about the kids and what they're doing with the kids. And, and it's not about the kids. It's never been about the kids. It's always just about self-serving themselves and giving themselves pats on the back and wanking themselves off in public. And the kids basically get charged $1 million for whatever stuff that they put out. There's nothing else that they do there. So I absolutely hate Team Jackets. I think they're a, an absolute nuisance. And I would much prefer if Team Jackets were actually given to kids who are actually legitimately doing cool and interesting things wherever city um, that those Team Jackets are being launched in. Maybe use the Team Jackets to launch and identify some cool kids doing interesting things. Don't just give them to the same old old fogies that are basically vibing or kind of, yeah, out, you know, vibing out people that are going to their stores and just being absolute cunts. I don't like it. I, obviously, I've always, always hated it. And um, I just can't i just yeah i've always hated it i've always thought it's fucking annoying um because there's no point like why select some people and not select others especially when the others people that you're selecting are like not like uh, i don't you know i don't want to say too much because i don't want to get in trouble but i hate team jackets they're the absolute scourge of society and they should be completely outlawed in every way shape or form they should be completely completely outlawed um moving on ahead what else do we have here we have to talk about yeah obviously talk about this this is courtesy of hypebeast it says yes Ducey and babe team up for a collaborative trucker hat and this one brings back a lot of bad memories too so this is courtesy of hypebeast um they've come together with babes obviously used to do a collaborative trucker hat pretty self-explanatory you've got the babe camo there on the cap with the stussy embroidered actually on the front the shape of it looks really cool the colors of the of the camo look amazing i'm always a big fan of the yellow sort of like sand camo i'm, I'm still looking for a snowball jacket in this exact camo color it's one of the best that jacket that they've got there from stussy is cool as well and the pink and I think it comes in black too, if I'm not mistaken. Let's double check here. Actually, I've got the tweet up here that's got all the colors of the actual hat. Yeah, so it comes in the kind of classic babe camo, pink camo, uh, purple camo, and black camo. The black's probably the weakest color. These are probably the best, all these three here. And obviously, they've come out. They're already sold out, so don't even bother trying. As you can see here, sold out, $99. Sorry, £99. Pretty decent. I like the fact that on the inside, the label is upside down, kind of a little head nod to the old school um babe stuff back in the day where the up uh, the logo on the back was either the back of the head and sometimes the logo inside the hats was always upside down so when you flicked it it was the right side up so that's a cool little motif they're done there and yeah it looks really good in terms of shape wise it looks nice the only thing i don't like about it is that it's a, the, the brim's already bent you know i want to flatten the brim i don't like my my 
my uh, the brims on my cap spent. But the reason why this brings up bad memories, I was going to say, was that back in the day when I used to go to um, the busy work, the busy workshop here in London in Upper James Street, it was like the only babe store here in London, like a one of the best kind of babe stores anyway in terms of merchandising and in terms of how it was kind of interior designed and whatnot. Of course, back in the day when Nigo was running babe, it was just an incredible brand to sort of experience in real time. But I kind of caught on to it late. I wouldn't say late, but like late-ish. I guess it was like 18, 19, around that time, probably. I'm um, starting to get into Bape and everyone that was queuing ahead of us was like old, much older. I think they were maybe like three, four years older than us, maybe in their early 20s. And they obviously had jobs and disposable income. So they were able to go in there. Or maybe they just had parents with money. They were able to go in there and drop loads of cash on stuff on a continual basis. Because that was a problem with Bape back then. They used to drop often, but the... They have to drop often, but obviously the retail price was really high, so you could only buy certain things. But obviously, if you had the funds, you could buy everything. And these guys would queue up, usually ahead of time, or they'd do this thing where they had friends that would basically hold their spots for them, or they'd just come in the morning and just jump the queue because they were like, you know, friends and family. And they'd always buy out all the things in there. And the thing that was really sucked about it is that you'd be queuing outside the store in the cold, in your little sleeping bag. They'd, they'd come in, jump the queue, um, or they'd come or they'd be there already so you'd have to sleep uh, behind them for how many hours knowing full well most likely when they get in they're going to buy an entire shop there's going to be nothing to buy um, and then you just have to take the L and what made it worse too the guys in that crew were fucking cunts there was this one Asian dude in the crew um, who if people kind of know me and know that era you know who I'm talking about this one Asian dude who was an absolute cock like the kind of guy that you want to brick over the head and this is again only buying stuff back in the day stuff seeing stuff when it comes to streetwear was so awful it was so flipping tense the people were so like you know catty and stuff the the scene now is much better the kids coming up now what they're doing the brands that they have how they kind of um build community the way they talk to their customers the it's much better than it was back then even the options are just much better you can definitely find some instagram brand that it's probably not as maybe as limited and as maybe high quality as all this kind of stuff you get from Studio Bay, but still, it maybe speaks to you better. Maybe the guy or girl that you kind of vibe with a lot more. It's just stuff that you maybe want to support because, you know, whatever you want to support it, um, it's more of your aesthetic, whatever. There's really cool stuff happening, like even regionally. There's stuff happening in LA, stuff happening in New York, stuff happening in middle America. I love it. But back then, it was really tense, man, really, really tense to the point where you thought you were going to fight somebody for a flipping, <coughs> you know, shark hoodie. And I remember this one particular time having to queue up in front of these flipping guys with, you know, deep pockets. They're in there buying all the babe stuff. And I think that was that was actually the first time in my life I saw somebody with like an Amex black card, you know, that titanium one. Oh, yeah, I saw a titanium one, I saw a black card. That's the first time in my life I saw someone, like a kid, basically, with one. I was like, oh, my God. And then, of course, they're dropping all that money. They're buying everything in the store. I remember one time I went to buy the flipping, you know, remember the babe and cause chompa varsity jacket i think it was like black and it had like the chompa teeth on the front really nice um and obviously they bought up every other every size because usually that baby store would only get it you know maybe two or three in each size and they bought every single one each one in the fat each one in the flipping crew and i remember after they left we went in there and the only thing they had from that drop that i could buy was sellotape <laughs> i remember that time leaving the busy workshop in flipping upper james street with fucking sellotape because these cunts bought everything out and don't even get started on the staff that worked in that store the staff were worse like they employed such cunts it was just so unbearable to deal with but you know in some cases again i still think it was a good lesson and a good life experience because it did it did kind of orientate me to kind of decide to just be a consumer and not try and partake in scene stuff i don't care about releases i don't care about being put on the list i don't care about all that shit and i make money if i want to buy the thing i just buy it and i enjoy it um, and i think that's a far better relationship to have because once you get too close to these sort of things especially when you love it really and you meet people who kind of you know maybe treat you a bit maybe not maybe not they're not as welcoming as you want them to be let me sorry it's rudely because rudely is like everyone's interpretation but let's say you what you have in your head a way they're gonna be and then you get there and they're not that way it can make you it can maybe make you fall out of love with it i knew that happened with me skateboarding right i went you know my first experiences going into slam city skates were flipping awful um those guys were really 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 rude like back in the day especially when i was coming up it was horrible um all these older again they were, it, it's just funny looking back in it because they were all older at the time you didn't know because you know you just thought everyone was either a couple of years older than you or not 
but they were much older than us at the time. They were maybe some of them were in their mid twenties, early thirties, and we were like teenagers, and they were just being cunts. Um, and it made me essentially fall out of skateboarding because everywhere I looked, it was just all little clicks. And then when the Palace crew came up, it was just again all that PWBC stuff. It was just I was just like vomiting in my mouth, looking at these boys pretending they're like <laughs> cosplaying as like working class kids. I just couldn't understand it like i just didn't get it like sovereign rings and gold tooth caps and stuff and reeboks like what are these people doing are they taking a piss out of people that i've actually grown up with or is this what they actually dress like um yeah and you know they went on to become millionaires so you know, what do i know but yeah bad memories and good memories regarding the babe and stussy stuff it's out now if you want it go get out and get it go out and get it these are quite cool right um have you seen these this is Kurt's just sneaker freaker. He's these Nike ACG Air Matters, which look really, really nice. I've always had a little bit of a thing for ACGs. I've had pretty much, I've had a lot of OGs, of vintage pairs. I've got a pair now at the moment, um, lava domes that are completely rotting on the sole. So I'll probably have to get those repaired very soon. But they look amazing in terms of shape and in terms of what they look, in terms of shape and just the overall um aesthetic are they like just the leather sorry the suede that they use the laces it's just it's just much better than what they put out nowadays but i do have to give them credit when acg department do retro some shoes they usually go for stuff that you probably aren't that familiar with they usually try and dig deep into the archive and again the to be honest i had no idea what their air matter was i wasn't really familiar with this model whatsoever um so for them to pull this out is pretty big look for them so let's just read this article on sneaker freaker it says it recently announced that the Nike All Conditions Gear team will be resurrecting the classic model from the mid 90s era of their catalogue, the Air Mada in a brown and dark green colorway. The silhouette dates back to 1994, a lightweight air injected hiking shoe designed by Sergio Lozano. Not the first time it was brought back, it was Limelight. Oh, I think that Sergio Lozano might be the Air Max 95 designer, you know, I'm pretty sure that name looks familiar. Um, it was also given some love back in 2010, reworked and labeled the Nike Air Mada 2K10. And now things are looking to get a whole lot more exciting as not only are multiple Air Mada styles hitting shelves in 2022, but the Colorway from 1994 is also making a return. Originally known as the Sandalwood Nike, as a Sandalwood, Nike are giving the re-up while featuring these hits of purple and green and the OG makeup meet with a black midsole and the Nike regrid outsole. Right now there's no release date yet, but the latest HGG matter, but stay tuned for incoming details. The only thing I'll say about them, again, they look really great. I think they're gonna be a, such a versatile shoe to wear. Most ACGs are incredibly comfortable and obviously great hiking shoes or just in general everyday shoes to have in your rotation. But in terms of what the actual OGs look like, they don't really hold a candle, do they? Let's be honest. In terms of what the actual OG shoe, again, maybe it's a rework to update because maybe they're more similar to that as opposed to this. Yeah, that's more of an air matter, right? The one that's over there. Is that more? That's more similar. Yeah, this is more similar, but still, in terms of shape and stuff, these still look far better, don't they? Than the actual one that's meant to be coming out. Maybe I'm being a little bit pedantic and being picky for no reason, but that's the only thing that I don't like about them. Nike, whenever they do retros, it's all, it's all right. But it's never perfect. Now, these are the best, isn't it? M maybe model-wise, the boots are probably the one that I would go for if I wanted a pair, to be honest. Now, again, this is the OG pair, and it's a bit different in terms of paneling, but I definitely like these boots as opposed to the actual sneak, the low sneaker itself. But it's just a shame that the matter they're putting out isn't perfect. You know what I mean, it's okay, don't get me wrong, but it's not entirely perfect. Uh, or it's not entirely... Um, it's not entirely... It doesn't entirely sort of reflect what the OG model looks like, but you know, maybe it's good enough for what we have available. For whatever reason, Nike don't seem to think it's important or that it's kind of worth trying to make retros that look like this. Like this is a vintage shoe, right? From a obviously from a scan from a magazine or a line sheet. And look at the shape of that compared to what they bring out. It just doesn't look the same, right? It pales in there, that kind of sharpness, that flatness in the front that profile is just completely different now they'll tell you it's a tooling because whatever tooling they used back in the day to make this shoe doesn't exist anymore but from what we've seen with adidas where they've been able to rework the campuses um the superstars from the ground up and actually give them the shape that they used to have in the 80s i don't see what's the excuses yeah i don't get it i don't agree and again this is a billion dollar company with all the resources in the world to do exactly what they want and they still tell you that they can't do it because of tooling just make a new tooling based on that model 
or buy an OG and just basically um, reverse engineer it. It shouldn't be that difficult to do. And again, I just approved it. They've done it already. Um, Converse have even done it with their Converse seventies that they have coming that they have you know that people obviously love. The shape of those is absolutely beautiful. Even I bought a pair. You know, I don't, I don't and I fucking hate Converse. So I never understood why this is an acceptable thing where they just they just put it out like and it's okay, but it's never like because that's the thing. This is probably an OG of some extent, right? And the reason why that shape is so important is because over time, once you wear them, they still maintain this excellent shape. That's the great, that's the benefit of having that OG sort of flat sole, flat profile. You know, you get what I mean, what it looks like, right? In terms of what this looks, there's a bit of a banana thing going on there. It just looks too shiny. You know what I mean? It just doesn't look that faithful to the actual OG. And if you're going to make, because again, you're not selling these to like tourists you're not selling this to like regular punters who want air force ones you're selling this a sneakerhead so i never understood why they don't just make things to spec if you're going to sell them to a really niche audience or customer base that cares about stuff like that that cares about the box that cares about the tissue cares about what the label looks like cares about the laces like we care if we're sneakerheads if that's the case make stuff that's sort of um true to the actual original shoe don't cut any corners don't just put it out just okay that's good enough no it's not mate let's make it what it actually looks like in the og because at the moment you know it, it definitely does pale in comparison when it comes to the og shoe and again the og shoe is this right it's that over here and look at that just look at that compared to what's meant to be coming out it just doesn't look the same it's not as good and yeah but again i'm a whore like everyone else is I'm a sucker like everyone else is and I'll just end up buying them anyway as everyone else does there's no other option I mean you're just gonna have to buy them um, because you're in love with the brand as I am you're faithful to the brand and you know they can basically do what they want with our retros and you're still gonna buy them you know they already broke my heart when they absolutely butchered the Air Max light um, you know that was one of the flipping worst atrocities ever to happen um, Air Max light yeah this is what the OG this is what the vintage one looks like <coughs> right that's what a, that's what an actual air max like is meant to look like no actually that's somebody's made them um, stain the the what you call it the new pair but an old pair is meant to look like this it's meant to look slightly like that even that's not correct i don't think yeah that is correct right that is correct yeah that is correct that's what an og is meant to look like and then the actual air max that came out looked like that like look how ugly that is compared to what the actual og looks like in terms of shape and everything like oh they absolutely ruined that shoe man so 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 disappointing and then you know like i no, actually that's somebody that's stained a pair of the old ones and tried to make them look old so i painted the new one trying to make them look old but the actual vin the actual ones that came out in the store looked horrendous like compared to the actual ogs they looked nothing like them whatsoever but i remember reselling a lot of these that when they dropped in jd sports and stuff back in the day on sneaker freaker forum I think if some of you guys old heads would probably remember me selling people Lees and Laser Blues back in the day, people, especially Australian customers, they'd purchase them and I shipped them over. That was a good time to stay to be alive. I'm not going to lie, but yeah, what can you do in it? Nike are going to do what they're going to do. We're going to have to just keep on keeping on. Next on the list here, we've got an article courtesy of Nice Kicks talking about some key cocker standing off um, Asics. Again, I'm not a big fan of Asics not the biggest fan of what kiko does in terms of fashion but i like um that he is kind of has a fresh approach when it comes to your collabs especially when it comes to shoes he's done some cool stuff with camper he's obviously done some cool stuff with asics and essentially single-handedly let's give the guy his props he has basically brought a6 back to life right they were essentially dead in the water i felt like because most um sneaker stores or most brands were you know willing to wait for the nike collab the adidas collab and whatnot and they weren't really willing to go for the sx1 but i think he's kind of breathed new life into that company so much so that they've given him if i'm not mistaken his own subdivision or he's got a role there there's something anyways there's a kind of long-term relationship they have with the guys so he's obviously done great things and i really like these man again i'm not a big fan of his aesthetic when it comes to fashion but i really really like these they look like something that i could wear immediately immediately everything about this looks amazing um what they called they're called uh the a6 hn 2 s proto blast that's a bit of a mouthful of a name in it i wonder if this is going to be a uh, a model that's already in line at a6 or something that he's basically built from the ground up let's see what the text says it says designer kiko kostadinov and sx have teamed up since 2018 and collaboration continues in 2022 as a new mashup silhouette for the two 
the key card because I have enough A6 HN2S Proto Blast, etc. Drop it is here. Seen in four different colorways, the sneaker features a hybrid design and uses a mashup of different A6 sneakers into one sneaker. Oh, is that what it is? It's a mashup. Interesting. It looks really good. It doesn't look like a mashup to me. Do you know what I mean? That's probably giving it credit. They've somehow made it look effortless or they somehow made it look sleek. And also, again, I'm blind like a bat. They've also hidden the A6 logo in plain sight. I didn't even notice that was it here on the side. That's really cleverly done, to be honest. I'm not going to lie. Um, it continues here. The A6 logo is seen in a exaggerated fashion on the lateral side and sculpted midsole features the flight foam based. Well, flight foam based cushioning. What kind of name is that? Horrendous. Um, Kiko Kostadin of A6HNS2, HN2S, Protoplus was scheduled to release in fall winter 2021, but due to supply chain issues, the release is now expected sometime later this year. Check out the protos below and latest updates. So yeah, supply chain issues are affecting a lot of sneakers. I think I remember seeing the uh, video of like the Kif designer talking about how some of his shoes he was meant to put out are delayed too, but these are great, man. This is probably a good time, good thing that they'll delay. There's a lot of sneakers that dropped last year, so maybe without all the noise, this will probably give them time to space to breathe and maybe um get the attention of some people but these whites and those that minty color in the back oh that is me all day long god damn that minty color is nice shit that looks good that looks really good you know these remind me of they just remind me of the only reason why I, i'm again i'm a fan of them but they just they remind me of like csm students the ones that carry around their big flipping um a1 folders and shit this is what it reminds me of csm students love to wear like you know um a6 made by kigo i guess maybe because he went there i'm not too sure but th this just reminds me of csm student shoes but i do like them and they look really really nice i'm not going to lie very 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 well done um you know really, really again that minty white colorway is the one what do you call it toothpaste or something whatever the colorway is called i don't know not naming people don't do that anymore nowadays and it? it feels like people don't name remember back in the day that was a thing people would name colorways things like green monster this and that and I think it came from Nike Talk. I think Americans love to name colorways, but I don't think we do it nowadays. People just, it's either a model or a collaboration, but it's not an actual name for the colorway, which is interesting. Um, anyway, we have to move. What else are we going to talk about here? Oh, this is interesting. Yeah, this is courtesy of Inst This is courtesy of The Verge. Just move it up to the So it looks like Instagram is testing out a paid subscription um, model for a small group of creators and I guess influencers they're probably going to roll this out to which is an um, interesting approach and maybe it's them reacting to the fact that I remember seeing a report that supposedly TikTok was the most so it was the most searched for site last year ahead of like Google and stuff crazy and I heard a lot of people too that I've seen on Twitter talk about how they basically use TikTok as their main video streaming or main video viewing platform. So if they want to check out how to repair something or how to cook a certain dish, they'll just go on TikTok because of course most of the videos are a minute long, if that. So you just get down to the actual, you know, the actual raw facts of what you need to do as opposed to all the fluff that you might get on YouTube. Like I, what I do where you're like, hi guys. And you know, updating people in your weekend and your day and you know, that you miss your mail or whatever nonsense that you dropped a teacup, but you're not actually getting to the actual heart of the matter. And people are basically turning that way. And then of course, on the other side of things, um, you know, brands and stuff are maybe being a little bit tight with how they're basically giving people deals um i know maybe instagram might be you know get dipping their hand in a little bit more when it comes to people getting influencer deals the whole ad hashtag thing so if this is maybe a better way to kind of give creators a reason to stay on instagram and maybe leave tiktok i don't know how tiktok um, monetization works on there but i imagine maybe it's the views maybe it's the ads maybe it's the clicks i'm not too sure how that works on there but if you want to compete with tiktok and make sure you keep all your best creators on your platform you need to pay them I think Clubhouse suffered the same sort of th faith, right? Clubhouse went, were trying to essentially get through the entire hype cycle and basically get to kind of selling the company without paying people that were basically making it hot. And it got to a point where those same people that made it hot ended up turning on them. And now Clubhouse has turned into what? The platform for old washed up gangsters to talk about how hard they are. 
it's not really culturally relevant in any way, shape or form anymore, which is a shame, but you know, they kind of shot themselves in the foot. But it's close to the verge, it says Instagram is testing a page description with a small group of creators. It says the following, US Instagram users will soon be able to subscribe to a small number of creators and influencers to access exclusive content and features. In a blog post, the company says it's launching a test subscription today with some more creators being added in the coming weeks. Fans will pay a monthly fee to access subscriber-only content from creators they follow. So it's basically like Substack, but for Instagram. Everyone's doing subscriptions, isn't it? There's subscriptions everywhere. Subscriptions coming out of the fucking wazoo. Um, the subscribers will also get a purple badge by their username that signals the status of the creator. Price tiers will range from $99 to $99.99 per month. You already know those, those flipping um, um, hustler type guys, those gurus, they're going to be charging the max. So are, so are the IG baddies. Imagine the IG baddies like t charging... Um, you $99 per month to see their morning routine and whatnot and then they miss one or oh, people are going to go crazy if they miss an upload <laughs> and creators can select the price point for their subscriptions co-head of product Ashley Yuki told TechCrunch that Instagram will not take a cut of creator subscription revenues until at least 2023 wow so they're basically doing this to get the creators to stay on Instagram and they're also not taking any money out of their pocket until next year which is nice you get a nice bit of earning potential there again to get people to jump on board because i'd imagine getting kids who have consumed your content on instagram for free for the longest to then be willing to subscribe is not going to be easy i would imagine so right to get people to do it so that's probably why they extended it for a year but let's see the quote here says i'm excited to keep building tools for creators to make a living doing creative work and to put these tools in more creators hands soon mark zuckerberg the ceo of meta which owns instagram bro and facebook posts facebook also has its own version of subscription program for its creators in a video today instagram head adam Missouri says subscriptions are one of the best ways for influencers and creators to have a predictable income some subscribers have already been monetizing instagram features like close friends by charging fans a fee of platform to access stories yeah true so this is maybe instagram's way of making sure the money is funneling through their hands in some way shape or form because i did hear that was a big thing happening i've heard it a lot in like with all those hip-hop like um baby mothers they do a lot of that stuff where they have a close friends list that you can join where you can basically see some of their debauchery like their debauch like activities on the weekend or whatnot or maybe more salacious pictures whatever it may be and that's a pretty clever you know hustle because you just get people to pay directly through venmo you know cash app paypal and stuff and then you get to keep all the proceeds and you know and all the benefits and your fans get nothing but a couple of you know um cutting room floor videos and then pictures and stuff that you are probably too shy to upload in your main feed because they made you look bad or because they're shit so it's a clever clever thing um, instagram and facebook aren't the only companies to roll out subscription models to compete with platforms like tiktok in 2021 twitter introduced sub super follows and some creators offer subscriber content off platform on patreon or Substack. wow people are doing subscriber only content off oh off off platform on patreon what are you gonna do on there are you gonna give people links to videos that are behind the paywall that's not on patreon that's weird isn't it the amount of paywalls that exist everywhere is just bizarre um i still think you know there's probably way too many options out there and not enough people willing to pay you know i think so in general i know for me personally i have only what subscribed and patreon to what two i think i only patreon to tim dylan and red scare podcast on patreon in terms of backing with my own money that's the only thing i do and then from time to time if i see a live i might chuck people a few you know a fiver here or there but that's about it most of the content i do enjoy for the most part is definitely enjoyed for free and if it isn't for free i got like paywall bypass plugins and stuff that makes allows me to read the article so i get it in some way shape or form they kind of have to do that because people aren't willing to pay because they've got ad blocks and all that sort of stuff and maybe the ad money is not the best so if you want to get people the, the ability to make money maybe increasing their options of generating that income is a better way to do it than limiting it in some regard because there was people are always going to find ways around it and people are already doing it now with the close friend stuff so i get flipping um i get instagram's approach and why they decided to go do through i get it i get it i get it this is an interesting article i also saw via um new york times which is really interesting because it's something that i kind of was lucky to escape in my youth i have to admit really lucky to escape so this is the following the headline of courtesy of the new york times says that cloud of smoke is not a mirage cigarettes once shunned have made a comeback with a younger crowd who knows better hmm I was really fortunate again I grew up in a very conservative Christian household um, very traditional 
and for the most of my youth I spent my time in church I didn't really go out anywhere until what the age of like 21 or something in terms of having my own freedom to do my own thing and even then it wasn't really freedom <laughs> it was me basically deciding to go out and my parents not being too happy about it but you know we got over that over time um and I think for that entire time that I was growing up stuff like smoking just wasn't on the cars because I had to go back home and I didn't want to smoke cigarettes and get absolutely lambasted and beaten and shit so you just would avoid that the one time I did rebel and try and do it outside my window it caused an entire earthquake in my house I mean in terms of mom just shouting and calling me all sorts of names so I didn't repeat that mistake again but I really was saved because of that and partly because of my football at the time I was playing football quite heavily I'd play Sunday league teams I'd train once twice a week play every single night in cages which obviously meant for the most part you would avoid a lot of things too because you're just playing football it wasn't some sort of like oh I'm having a clean lifestyle because I play sports no it's just because you were always playing football and then when you weren't playing football you were hanging out with your friends and then when you weren't with your friends you were in school there was no time to get drunk or get fucked up there wasn't any time because everyone which is why i understand why people say stuff like you are the company you keep because at that time everyone i was around was either trying to make music or they were playing football and when they were making music they were in the studio for like 17 hours and we were playing football we were at the flipping cages until the lights turned off which was like 11 p.m so people were really 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 passionate about those things which meant that you didn't really have any other passions because your entire attention was basically pulled into that one field so or that into that one interest or that one hobby so that's the one thing i'm really thankful about growing up in a somewhat having a somewhat lame kind of teenage life you know because i wasn't really allowed out, i didn't really do stuff it did allow me to avoid the scourge of smoking because of people that i do know who smoke who enjoy it they say it's one of the hardest habits to break like it's really difficult to decide okay i'm going to stop and to stick with it for a long time which is why when people do um quit for even a number of days they're so proud of themselves because they can never picture themselves getting five days six days ten days in the bank do you know what i mean so to see kids purposely deciding no this is what i want to do is really intriguing especially when you consider all the health advice out there that basically tells you all the negatives about smoking but it's one of those things that people are willingly deciding and maybe it's like, it's like alcohol too excessive alcohol alcohol drinking or consumption is always it's also going to have some adverse um, health effects but people tend to do that but i think the smoking thing there's clear evidence that it's really really not good for you but people choose to do it anyway because life is short i guess i don't know but let's read the article it says on a recent not so wintry thursday in bushwick neighborhood of brooklyn when the only snowflakes seen were over text a gang of 20 something stood in a circle outside cleaning gallery sorry clearing gallery and sharing a pack of american spirits a few days earlier columbia university a 19 year old pre-med student started uh, stared enviously at her phone screen at parisian women in cute dresses walking cigarettes in hand before stepping outside for a cigarette with her friend she requested not to be identified by name because she didn't want her habit to affect her career in medicine uh <laughs> Um, astonishing isn't it when you see a nurse smoking outside of a hospital you're like what but anyway um people are smoking online too on instagram tamzin urshin irashin irashin a photographer and stylist posted a story of her boyfriend arsun sorrenti um son of photographer mario sorrenti catching a lit cigarette in his mouth on tiktok charlie jordan a dj and model tried a sexy french in hell for her 7.7 million followers smoking his back said isabel rower a 24 year old sculptor one of the spirited americans outside clearing weirdly in the last year or two all my friends who didn't smoke now smoke i know why no one is really addicted to it it's probably more it's more of a pleasure activity and it also looks cool let's not deny that let's not deny that if you've got a banging outfit on and you're cute as fuck and you're feeling yourself stepping out for a cheeky sig whilst you wrap your arms around yourself and you talk or you talk on your phone or you're giggling with your cool friends does look really cool like no one can deny that it really does um and and i'm assuming you know if you're one of those people that you know use it as some sort of um what's that what they call it as some sort of uh hunger suppressor right people use it for that they'd smoke cigarettes so they don't need to eat too much it's fucking wild to say but people do do that or they'll have like a can of coke with a cigarette and just fast the entire day it's a flipping cake moss diet so i'm sure a lot of people are doing it for that sort of thing too but definitely for the core side of things and maybe for social side of it as well because nowadays especially in the uk 
you can't smoke indoors anywhere really for the most part unless you you know you're at your friend's bar or you're locking somewhere but legally you're not allowed to smoke anywhere inside so you have to step outside into a smoking area which basically allows you the privilege to be able to talk to people for free without it being weird because you need a light or because you might need a cig or because you might need a filter so it kind of allows you to basically talk to people and for maybe get make some new friends maybe hook up with somebody regardless of what it may be um so there's that side of things and maybe during the lockdown with this um isolation we all felt maybe having the option or the ability to step outside and share a cig with somebody a stranger is actually a pleasure it's actually something that kind of reminds you of what life used to be and then people are trying to maybe that cigarette represents that you're basically trying to hold on to what a life we used to have prior in 2019 and before so and before that sorry right where life was simpler and you could go out and do whatever you wanted to do and people didn't care if you got vaccinated or not you know what i mean <laughs> it continues, says um, across new york city as a pandemic waxes and wanes um a social activity that seemed diminished or replaced seems to have reappeared have cigarettes those filthy cancer causing things and still the number one cause of preventable death in the united states according to the center of disease and control lost their taboo so even ahead of flipping you know people not wearing their seat belts um cigarettes are still the most uh, uh preventable cause of death in the states crazy um this is a kate frey a 25 year old copywriter who lives in brooklyn picked up the habit last year she says we're having a very sexy the feral um, 1980s revival and smoking is part of it a lot of people i know are just posting pictures doing it i'm doing it it's having its moment for sure weird at the same time cigarette smoking has been a steady decline among adults in the united states in 30 years david hammond a professor of public health at the university of waterloo said the drop has been fueled by a largely by young people it says a decline in initiation among youth and young people in predominantly uh responsible for the overall decline in smoking in the population yet in 2020 for the first time in two decades cigarette sales have increased so this is a recent thing so i think it's definitely to do with lockdown 100 percent. i definitely have thing has to do with it people are just picking it up as a thing to do because it makes you social and maybe there's a stress relief part of it too i'm sure it kind of brings some level of um it kind of yeah it, it kind of eases the stress that you're going through and allows you to kind of blow it away you know metaphorically and figuratively but it continues yes there's the decline in da, 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 niagara Na, niagara nargis a scientific director of tobacco control research at the american cancer society said that there was evidence of a higher level of smoking it's possible not just young people but there are higher sales which indian sorry which indicates higher consumption or oh, brain buster it's a great picture look how cool she looks just mouth only everyone looks cool smoking a cigarette a little bit lighter it just looks cool um it continues here it says anecdotally you hear a lot of stories about new yorkers who are celebrating being out of their homes with excess said michael Salibak, a national assistant of vice president for the state public policy in american lung association the questions researchers are trying to figure out are are we actually seeing more smokers are we seeing more frequent smokers or is this a time we weren't going out erasing the memory of what it was to have smokers standing outside bars all of them possible true that's true um we have the, the something in together the obvious it's just a long article it's a long one yeah, i'm not gonna read the entire thing but yeah you get the drift you get the drift um what do you think what i would like to know uh, if you are a smoker are you or do you did or you started smoking during the pandemic why did you start smoking i'd love to hear that in the comments below um did you stop smoking during the pandemic that would also be cool to know um and do you think it's cool yay or nay i do I think everyone featured in this article looks really cool. I'm I'm guessing it's a very cool hipster bar in general. There's a person here with a mullet, you know, sharing a, a, a cigarette outside of a bar because they both can't afford a lighter. Two people that can't afford a lighter, but they've probably got a couple of grams in their pockets and it never understood that sort of like way of kind of navigating the world. But you know, we've all got we've all got our things. We've all got our things. Uh, what's the time here? Have I talked too long in it? Oh, 108. Yeah, 108. Oh, let's move on. Let's move on. What else we got to talk about here? Let's do this. Where is it? Yeah, let's do this. Let's do this. So, this is it. So, um, this is news, news courtesy of RA, which I'm a little bit unsure about 
what I think about it, but instinctively I don't like it. But let's just read it. It says here, New London Festival Risen announces non-male lineup run by women members at local promoter run by women members at local promoter Percolate. The day event will debut in Hackney Wick on September. Sorry, on Saturday, the 9th of April. Um, the article says as follows a new day festival called risen is coming to london on saturday 9th of april um, running from midday through to midnight across multiple venues hackney wick risen will celebrate what the festival team calls the divine feminine the lineup is 100 percent non-male which just imagine if you call that toxic masculinity or the divine masculinity how people would feel bizarre the lineup is 100 percent non-male with slots with uh, for amelia angel delight club fitness hannah holland iona jay ward Kira, Sucro, Raw Silk, Tasha, Elsie, and more. Risen is presented and programmed and marketed by the women team members at the London Promoter Percolate. The event will also offer opportunities for non males in areas of the industry that have historically been male dominated, such as sound engineering, lighting, and venue operations. The aim for the entire festival staff to be non male. <sighs> even the security, they want even security members to be non male, or is that going to be male security members? Like, this is such a bizarre thing to do, man. I really don't understand this. But anyway, continue. This is a quote. Risen is a festival run by women to shine light on the up-and-coming talent who works so tirelessly across the music industry. Said Percolates Kitty Bartlett. Uh, oh, I know Kitty. Is she part of it? Okay, that's interesting. Um, be that DJs, event managers, graphic designers, lighting techs, and so on. It's time for a new energy. Here's the full lineup. Of course, there you got the full lineup of people playing. Sign up for pre-sale tickets, blah, blah, blah. All right. Off the bat, I don't like it because I think... If you want to change, because again, I've been very critical of the fact that these lineups are all the same. It's the same old people playing, male or female, right? Let's just keep that 100% you know, correct, especially when you look at some of the more commercial mainstream festivals. It's the same 10 female DJs that get picked rotation. They just kind of rotate them around in different sort of places or different sort of locations, depending on what their schedule is saying. But it's not as if the issue is just a disproportionate amount of people from a particular gender are being represented it's the fact that these booking agencies number one don't uncover or sign on new fresh talent that will basically maybe um shake things up a little bit it's the same sort of archetypes that get signed and basically presented again and again and again some of them manufactured some of them organic but regardless it's the same old people coming through just replacing the older heads that are already there and again like i said the female members are there too it's not like they are going out of their way to bring in new blood to basically take over from them they're also holding space and also basically playing the same festivals again and again every single year um you could basically you know you've seen one nina kravitz set unfortunately again i love the good woman um i've seen her here at the woman store assembly hall and it was really good but you see one nina kravitz set you've seen them all you've seen one amelia ellen set you've seen them all shoulder with same thing same thing goes for um what's her name what's the russian lady's name that i messaged on instagram oh I forgot, but you know who I'm talking about, right? There's a few of them. There's a whole, there's like 10 of them who are basically prominent that people seem to like. Let me see what that, what's that lady's name. I forgot her name. But there's a lot of them that kind of all do the similar sort of thing, which again, I think is more so an issue with the industry at large and less so about men specifically. But again, it's maybe an refreshing thing to do overall. Yes, it nasty. It's the same thing. You heard one nasty say, you've heard them all. It's all the same sort of stuff. What I think needs to happen, in my own opinion, is that there needs to be more variety in general in the lineups. It doesn't necessarily matter your gender, just more variety. Now, don't get me wrong. For nights I've put on in the past, I've always said before, I was, I wouldn't say a four leader, but I was one of the few people in the scene that I was coming when I was putting them on parties that I basically would book female DJs that couldn't DJ just because they were cool looking, right? Just Or just to give them a shot or just to basically mix things up a little bit. I just let them play. And then over time they got good um and they started to improve and they started to actually enjoy it and it got to a point where they were basically regular kind of djs that I basically have on rotation maybe every other month or so but it was always a a refreshing thing to have on the lineup because sonically you could be standing at the bar i've always said this and you could definitely hear a difference in terms of the tonality the songs chosen the energy when there's a female playing behind the decks it's just it's a bit different especially when you're used to going out and only hearing male dj so it's important to have some representation but i think the industry at large has an issue with just having the same people playing regardless of gender it's not about gender it honestly is i don't think so especially in london most of the bigger clubs don't book people based on gender they book them based on ticket sales and if you're male or female it doesn't matter you're just going to keep getting bookings even if you're terrible you're just going to keep getting bookings because you can sell tickets hard tickets and that's the only thing those guys look at i remember hearing one 
debate or like panel discussion with a guy from fabric who was this is before the pandemic also right i think now things have changed obviously because they've got no option um because of i guess the you know the visa regulations and brexit and stuff has affected people's ability to basically fly in the likes of ricardo Villalobos or marco corolla and to just fill out a venue so now they have to rely on the up-and-coming talent which is why a lot of these clubs are starting up residency programs which they didn't care about before resident dj programs were completely dead in the water because they just wanted the main person to to play they wouldn't even put your name on the line up sometimes if you were a supporting or warm-up dj and it'll just have you playing the graveyard shift and then the perfect the main person comes on and you just get told to skedazzle here's your drink tokens knock yourself out that would be it now that's an issue it doesn't matter if that's a woman or a female a woman or male that person needs to get the same amount of light i think so as a main headliner that's flying over from flipping chile or whatnot let's have everybody given an opportunity to kind of shine to get a new audience to get better but they don't do that and i think personally responding to the same old tied lineups with an all-female lineup just feels like you're repeating the same mistakes that the old kind of regime did back in the day that's the way it feels like it just feels like repeating the same thing because imagine if this becomes a really popular festival and it becomes really well known and everyone this, this becomes a star and they start to actually go out and sell out different locations that aren't just this festival then what are you then going to get new blood to fill in those old spots or are you just going to keep those same people because they sell tickets that's the issue at hand and that's exactly what happened with places like the you know those ades and all these sort of kind of events and whatnot um I can't figure the other one as well, the massive one. But there's loads of all those mainstream events that basically done the same thing. They started with a core group of DJs who were very popular, who they kind of guided through their career or they kind of, you know, worked alongside as they were kind of ascending in their career. And then because they could be more popular, they just sold the tickets, they just stuck with them. And they didn't use that opportunity of that attention to kind of bring more people through, which is always a missed opportunity. So I think this essentially doesn't necessarily solve what's going on because I think the same 10 djs that get picked especially the female ones it's not like they're kind of reaching back and bringing girls through i don't see them doing it maybe nita kravis has done it a few times maybe nastia has done it maybe a couple of times she's got some youtube thing that she does where she like yeah i think she does some who, who was on it someone was on it that i know but she done something right where she helped to bring up some girls and whatnot but for the most part they don't do jack shit to help someone come up like i can't remember you know i like the black madonna but who has she brought through that's been a new dj that somebody's been able to get you know who she's kind of mentored and said yeah this is a new person that should be you know also working in conjunction with me or alongside me it doesn't necessarily happen so that is a, is a big issue and again it's not their responsibility no one's no one should be forcing peggy good to bring people through that's not your responsibility you're an artist go and perform but i think the problems that exist are far reaching and an issue with the industry at large the whole thing about wanting to have female like sound technicians and tech it just yeah i guess it's a good initiative you can try that but i would imagine the reason why there aren't a lot of women in that industry isn't because of sexism i'd imagine because maybe they're just not interested in those kind of roles so if anything maybe try and get more women interested in roles that they want to do would be a better way to go about things than trying to force something that isn't necessarily that isn't something that really demanding so something they're really kind of asking for hey i want to be a sound engineer hey this um lighting industry is really da -da -da -da, dominated by I, I don't know maybe i'm maybe I'm, I'm too far away from it but i wouldn't imagine that's an issue um i'd imagine again the issue is again is that these promoters that are putting on these events are lazy and they're not willing to maybe try out new venue operators new sound engineering teams or maybe the teams that are, are basically grandfathered in and tied into the venues and you can't easily go out and hire a, an external team to come in and do your flipping lighting and stuff or whatever i don't know maybe something to do with that but that's a weird one and again how far does that stretch does that go to the security does that go to the bar staff does that go to like, it's just just a weird it's just a weird thing to do like it doesn't necessarily and i've never gone to a festival and thought oh there's not enough girls working here that's not the first thing i think of i think is the festival good yeah or no and if it is everything else that they're doing in terms of what they want in terms of reputation present sorry what they want in terms of um representation comes second it's not necessarily a thing that you worry about you would imagine so but again the good thing i like about it nowadays is that people are trying at least to offer an alternative to what's out there already so you're seeing all these alternative club nights you're seeing the return of club kids people are just providing alternative to the main to the to the same old kind of boring stuff that exists out there in terms of mainstream dance dance uh, dance music events and whatnot but I just don't know if this is constructive. I just don't know if this sends out the right message. I just don't know if this is just repeating the same mistakes that happened prior. 
um but you know it's worth a try you know maybe it works maybe people like it um if it's a resounding failure does that mean that people don't want to hear female DJs in this capacity I don't think so I think it's going to take a lot to kind of get this sort of stuff up and running and especially to resonate with a particular crowd but also Hackney Week is probably the best place to do it because people seem to be very open to new newer sounds and whatnot over that kind of place especially with the new program that's going on at the Colour Factory is clearly a place where people are a bit more open-minded but I think in general I would much prefer just to be a far-reaching sort of hey we're trying to shake up the entire kind of festival sort of you know play you know the entire festival landscape and we're committed to basically having a lineup that isn't repli that isn't going to be replicable anywhere else because that's the thing that always happens in the summer whenever festival season comes around the lineups are exactly the same right everyone's playing at the same like this is like everyone's booking the same people maybe with a couple of weeks gaps and stuff but it's the same old people it's the same friends it's the same whatever but no, let's just have some fresh talent that's like no one's heard of that isn't associated with anybody someone you just plucked off the street from flipping soundcloud or whatnot that's how it should be but you know again these are things that you need to start off with little by little baby steps and hopefully maybe across the way it kind of develops into something but i just think sending out the message that you will have a all-female lineup and then uh, guys go out there and put on an all-male lineup which they've done previously before but you know it's just like, oh we're gonna have a festival that's only for dudes people would really respond negatively to it so you know but hey you gotta start somewhere in it you gotta start somewhere i guess you have to start somewhere um and i think that might be where we might end it you know yeah let's end it there this is excellent thing show so number five four five thanks again for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company and to see you guys once again if it's the first time checking out the youtube you know what to do smash a like hit subscribe if you're listening via the podcast app a five four three two one star review will help you know how it is right that will definitely help the cause and of course the link to patreon to access all that is in the description so you can get access to my bonus episodes of the show one episode per week on the bonus side of things so definitely get involved there if you want to and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care peace